the morning, you're gonna wake up and you find out, oh, my coffee machine is broken and it's gonna be terrible. And then you have to spend the weekend looking for a new coffee machine and buying a new coffee machine and it's something you don't wanna buy. Oh. So, what happens if you don't actually own that coffee machine? If it lives at your house and you pay for the service and the access to the coffee machine, but you don't actually own the machine. So if anything happens to it, the company would have to replace it for you. So if you never own the machine, then it's not a big deal. So this could be facilitated by the internet of things. So IoT and machine to machine communication could help the original equipment manufacturer who owns the machine. They can uh, get all the data from the machine and find out, ooh, there's a part that's maybe a little bit problematic, so we need to send someone to service it and replace it before the whole machine is just broken. So, and because you never own it, the original manufacturer maintains the ownership of it, it's in their best interest to build machines that will last, to design machines that will last. They will have to take out this, the planned obsolescence, like when they build things just, just enough so that it will break in five years so you'll have to replace it, that's totally planned. So now they will have to remove that because it's, it's their responsibility to maintain that product. So. Right, Brie, now that we've talked yeah. all of these things through, mm -hmm. is circular economy really a possibility? Is it real? Um, yes, no, maybe, maybe. Eh, it, okay, it can be if we all collectively, every single person on the planet, decide to embrace these new business models, and then also we can implement and apply these new technologies to these business models, then maybe. But right now, let's have a quick review at, at the, the way that it works now. Right. So, the way we have been going on thus far, we used to take things, we used to make things, we used to sell those things, and this is us consumers. So, you know, we bought something, we used it for a little while, then we got bored of it, or it broke, what we're doing, we throw it away. So, a better way to use it, or a choice that we have, is to repair it, or put it on eBay, or share it with someone else, make something else out of it, or recycle it in a more sustainable way. But, but that's so much work for us, right? Like, I have to make the, the choice to repair it. I have a, you know, a, a crappy Ikea chair. You know, I could repair it, because I can repair anything. Um, but, um, but I could repair it, or I could just, maybe somebody else wants to take the time to repair it. So I just put it in the bin, right? It's too much effort for me. It's not worth my time to repair that, right? Or to refurbish it or to reuse it. And so, but the problem is, is that it's all on me. It has nothing to do with the manufacturer. They have no responsibility with how it ends up. Once it's in our hand, it's our problem. But the thing is, is here, this is all money that just goes, it's literally just thrown in the trash when all that could be recovered. So here is where all the business opportunities lie. Here's where I think all the money can be made. If you can figure out a way to effectively collect all of those waste items. Now actually, talking about the money. Mm -hmm. So if we do all that, you know, if we take a step back and slow down and reuse and reduce and recycle and all that, are we actually going to make more money? Or are we going to sell less and therefore grow slower? Mm, okay. So there's a big question. How will we measure success? So if we aren't buying as much, how do we measure success? Does success equal growth? Does growth equal sales? Open oh, question. <laughs> okay, here's our, our references and ta-da! Okay, thanks everyone. Yeah. And I just want to give a shout out to my team, to Annika Lohmann, Annie Schumacher, and Paula Schaudig for their hard work on um, helping to make this presentation. Yeah. Okay, next up we have Miriam Lassonig, who's from Reverse Logistics Group, and she's going to talk to us about 
circular solutions that they provide. Thank you. Welcome, Miriam. and Tatiana for this nice introduction and your enthusiasm about this concept of a circular economy. Well, I'm here to share some insights with you from a perspective of a company that calls itself to be an enabler, an enabler for the circular economy. Because we are specialized in returning products, taking them back, collecting back them in, on behalf of producers. So um, while others are focused on the supply chain and helping to produce and sell products, well, we're actually the ones who help to bring them back in order to maintain them, to reuse them, to refurbish them, or to recycle them. You've seen that in the model just now. And we do that on behalf of networks. So we build large systems and networks where we collect all the materials and products back from the consumer, back from the users. And we are a fourth party logistics provider, meaning that we don't have any assets, any facilities like trucks, um, but we are only managing those material flows. And of course, we do this on an international level and multi-channel to set up these big networks. So just to give you some insight of that, these are our branch offices around the world. And um, yeah, we have branch offices in Latin America, Asia, and Europe. We just opened up a branch office, for example, in India, where we help producers to collect back their end-of-life electronics because they are forced to do so by the law. Okay, so, but I'm here today to give you some insights also on the challenges. The challenges that we see as a uh, company that's called the Reverse Logistics Group and for the producers. So, as Bree and Tatiana just mentioned, that's what we have today, or more or less. Um, this is um, how organizations, producer organizations, run their businesses forever, like for ages. It was take, make, dispose. And it got take, make, dispose faster and faster over the years, ending up with a product, product variety that doubled in the last 15 years and product life cycles that were short by 24% at the same time. So for our producers this means two issues. First of all, they need more and more raw materials in order to produce those new products. And secondly, they are in a permanent battle to win customers, because imagine in the past, you went and bought a TV every 10th year. Now you go and buy a new one every second or third year. So if you are a producer, you have to convince your con consumer often and more often, right? You're in this constant battle because product life cycles are so short and there's such a big variety of products. So, and now we hear and say, and producer, you, you need to recycle because that helps you in order to have your raw materials supplied. That's where you get your materials from. And also, well, we don't want to end up in huge box of waste. Please help us to get rid of that waste and have proper waste management installed. But the problem is, well, there's always collection needed because if you want to recycle a product, well, you first have to get it. You first have to collect it. And this can be very expensive because a product can, or a material can end up anywhere in the world. You don't have control. As a producer, you have no power to control where your product goes. Also, you first have to find out where it ended. So, where is the material? Big, big question. 
And then if you finally find your product, your end-of-life product, well, it can be in a very bad condition. It can be as good as new, but it can be also totally worn out. You really don't know, right? So, in the perspective of, the, of a producer, here's the thing. Well, we have circular economy in place already, or at least some recycling efforts. But it's mostly driven, not by the producers, but by some third parties. It's driven by scrap dealers, it's driven by recycling companies, or any other business owner who is doing refurbishment or whatnot. But producers normally don't have any power to control such reverse and collection flows. <coughs> So, how can we change that? How can we rethink this model or re redesign it? Or you remember this model here of the circular economy and imagine producers would have control and power of this whole circle of, or this, those whole flows. Imagine they were the one to decide what happens with the product. Just as Tatiana and Bree mentioned, they were the ones to decide what happens with the product after usage. And there are just some necessities and um, requirements that you need in order to do that. Um, well, first of all, that's a prerequisite. Well, your product needs to be recyclable. It must be designed in a way that allows a recycling or refurbishment and we just saw the smart uh, the fair phone, that's one example, but that's just one, right? And also, you would, or what helps a lot is if you can track a product so that you know where it ends up. And in order to control those circular flows, well, it helps a lot if you are in touch with the user. Because only the user can tell you when he's finished using this product or when he wants it to be replaced or whatnot. Also, it helps a lot, and we've seen that in your presentation already, if you keep ownership, because only then you have power and, and you have the control to take it back. And also, it's helpful if you know the condition of your product. And luckily, we have some solutions to that, and this is tied to our digital uh, theme here. Uh, well, thanks to e-commerce and other options, well, direct selling is on the rise and this really helps producers to be in touch with the user. Also, such plans like leasing or pay-per-use or subscription model <laughs> help a user to have control over what happens to the product. If he stays the owner, or well, he is the one to decide when it's when a user should finish the usage or when it's time to take it back. And thanks to IoT, the Internet of Things, well, it's easier to know the condition of the product. It's easier to know when it's defective or can be replaced. This is an idea how we think producers could drive, really drive the circular economy and not just be forced to collect things where they don't know where it ended up or forced um, yeah, to, to source some secondary material from all over but not from their original products. So that's the idea. And again, the decisive point is here when we decide as users while well, we finished its use. And to give you an example how this could work, here's the example of a washing machine that's, of course, intelligent. So it has internet connection. And so we know about its condition. It sends us some status information and updates. Let's see, is it? Also, imagine we would not sell the product, but give it out on a pay-per-use or leasing plan. 
And of course, we would need to be in a constant relationship, in a constant communication with the user, with our customer. Well, then as a producer of such a washing machine, we could decide, well, we take it back and we make two washing machines, uh, one washing machine out of two or three or five, doesn't matter, but we could use parts of it and refurbish it. Or if it's a totally worn out product, well, we could at least use the plastic from the housing and uh, make new washing machines, housings out of it. So we could then really control such circular flow. But why aren't producers doing this? Why is it so tricky, so difficult to implement such a concept? Well, this is part of the answer, I think, because it really needs a lot, needs a lot of changes. It affects really not only the way of how you sell off your products, but also how you design them, how you source your materials, how you bring them back, and it affects your whole business strategy. So it really means a lot of change. And that's why also me, I'm asking, well, is this whole circular concept a nice vision, or is it just an illusion? Because here are some more thoughts that I have and producers have. How we as users, as consumers, or no, can we really reuse, refurbish, and recycle all products? Are all products really capable of being recycled? Maybe it applies to smartphones or washing machines, but what about clothing? What about furniture? What about car? Yeah, well, with cars, we, we know, but. There's so many yeah, packaging, there's so many products out there. Also, are we as users ready to prefer used products over new ones? And then how do roles change for producers, the retail business, and for us as users? Other question is not owning a product a serious option for us as users? Are we okay with just renting out our coffee machine, our clothing, our smartphone, whatnot? Or do we want to own it? And last but not least, what about data exchange and protection? Imagine a producer knows every time you switch on your TV or your well, washing machine, yeah, maybe. So. yeah, your Netflix. <laughs> Are we ready? Are we okay with that? Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to have a discuss discussion later on and to your questions, but that's yeah. it for now. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much. Very serious, lots of serious thoughts. So, if you guys want to take one thing out of this, if you're 30 years old and your mom still does your laundry, this is okay. This is embracing circular economy. This is access over ownership. Right. So, here we go. Guys, so here we are today at Microsoft. And if you... <laughs> just checking, you know. Um, so, if you want to come here more often, one option is to get a job here. Right, and here I got, you know, right people over here, lovely Constanza and lovely Christina, I'm going to tell you how to do that. Okay. Thank you, Tatiana. So, hello everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask a question. So, um, at the beginning, you were asked how many students there were, or what your profession is. So, could all the students please raise your hand? Okay, so, yeah, hi to you. <laughs> I'm sorry for the other, like, 98%, <laughs> because this is not very, very interesting for you. Um, but my name is Constance, and I'm a university recruiter here at Microsoft. 
And I'd like to present to the students here um, the options that you have if you want to join Microsoft. For the others, if you're interested in working at Microsoft, you probably just know that you have to apply for a job. <laughs> Um, yeah, for students, we, um, it's basically the same, but we have two options. We have two different programs. Um, we have the STEP program and the MACH program. The STEP program is for students that um, are in the middle of their studies who would like to work as, a, as an intern or as a, as a working student. So usually the interns are here for 40 hours a week, the working students for 20 hours a week, and um, the, the areas that you can work in are technology sales, marketing, IT consulting, finance. So we have a broad field where you can work. Um, it starts twice a, week, uh, twice a year, so either in spring or in autumn. Also, you get a really good paid. <laughs> um, if you're part of the program, you can join local events, you, can, you have a mentor, and afterwards, you are all, also part of the bonding program, which is called Step Ahead. So you stay in touch with us, and then hopefully you come back for the MACH program. And the MACH program is for those of you who are interested um, in joining Microsoft after their studies. So if you um, say, let's say you're interested in working as an IT consultant after your studies, feel free to apply for the MACH program. So the MACH program um, is basically a full-time job, permanent contract, and it also starts twice a year and um, is for 18 months. So if you're interested, please feel free to apply. Um, <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> so if you're interested, feel free to contact me. Um, also, I'll be there standing outside with my colleague Christina, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And if not, just write us a mail. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. So guys, if your niece hasn't got her summer figured out yet, so this is the person to contact. And actually, you know, I did my last internship when I was 31 years old means I'm at least 31 years old now. <laughs> right, guys, so I'll let you figure that out and many other things and talk about circular economy because it's time to take a break. One, one thing real quick, um, so there's more beer and pizza, please eat it and drink it all. And then if you don't drink beer and you would like something non-alcoholic, in the kitchen there is a fridge full of sodas and coffee, coffee and, and tea. Things. So please feel free to... Back here in 10 minutes. Yay!